This is not marketing. No! Prepare for learning. Hello everyone, I am Asher Milgram, the CEO and Chief Scientist of AMA Regenerative Medicine and Skin Care. My specialty is biomedical sciences and we specialize here in integrative medicine and regenerative medicine and we are privileged to be doing all sorts of very interesting research with stem cells and that's the subject of this talk, this presentation. I intend to condense um, a lot of uh, very sophisticated science into very simple language to give you an overview of stem cells. What they are, what they do, where we find them, why they are so important to us. So we're starting with this slide, which is obviously a slide from the Hubble telescope of cosmic events. This is a cosmic nebulae, which really represents the creation of the universe. If you look in there with the special telescopes, you can see all the way back to the beginning, the Big Bang, when the universe was created. I'm starting with that because the power of creation cosmically is also present in that stem cell. The power of creation of our own physiology, of our own health, our vitality, is all imbued, inherent in those magic stem cells. In fact, many people call the stem cell the God cell. And here he is, that's the stem cell right there. We'll talk much more in detail about it later. Um, this picture and this one here are depictions of the many different ways that science, ancient science and modern science, looks at human physiology. Whether you are of, of a spiritual nature or not, there's no question that human physiology is filled with mystery and miracles and magic. It's magical what goes on in us, deeply, deeply mysterious. We barely understand it. We're just scratching the surface of our understanding of the unfathomable complexity of human physiology. Um, for those who do have a kind of a spiritual bent to it, there's no question that the, that the human physiology is a microcosm of the greater cosmos in all its complexity. Um, there is no question for those who see the complexity and the miracle of it, the mystery of it, that it's kind of like touching the mind of God. And hopefully throughout this lecture and therefore thereon, you will have an, a, a different experience with your own physiology. You are walking around within this incredible, dynamic, multi-dimensional kaleidoscope of extraordinary intelligence that created us. All right, so let's get on with stem cells. Best way to start a, a conversation about stem cells is to ask the very simple question, what is health? In Western modern medicine that we're all familiar with here in Europe and in, in the United States, um, the industry of medicine is really focused on disease. It really isn't focused on health. In fact, it doesn't even really define it, let alone find ways to augment it or to accelerate it or to promote it. Well, it so happens that stem cells deal both with disease and with giving us optimal health. The best definition of health is in fact tissue turnover. When we are young, and our bodies are filled with stem cells, by the way, we have amazing regenerative capacity. We're constantly turning over all of our tissues. Cells are designed to work at peak efficiency until they cannot, and then they are designed to die. It's called programmed death or cell death. 
or otherwise known as apoptosis. And those cells that are now dysfunctional and dying are replaced with healthy, new, young, nascent baby cells with their whole life ahead of them. Again, this is cellular turnover. So when you were a kid, you had a new liver every few months. All of your organs were completely replaced every few months. And as we age, that process of cellular and tissue turnover slows down. The stem cell is in fact the engine of that regeneration. It's the stem cell that has the ability to replace those dying cells with new cells. And in fact, every organ in your body is filled with stem cells that have become the, the cells in charge of regenerating that organ. In liver, there are liver stem cells that regenerate new liver cells, and in your kidneys, and in your vasculature, etc. All over your body, stem cells specializing in different organs. Now, here is again that same picture of the stem cell. And I wanted you to look at it again here more carefully. This is a mesenchymal stem cell that's extracted out of umbilical cords. And you'll see that the cell has little bumps on it, those little bubbles all over the surface. These are vesicles, and those vesicles are filled with all sorts of magical signaling molecules, cytokines, and things like that, that play a very important role in what the stem cells can do for us and how they function in our bodies. So hold this image in your mind, and we're going to get back to it. Now, stem cells. What is the promise of regenerative medicine? Number one, to cure disease. There are many diseases that, are, that afflict our population that modern medicine doesn't cure, it just manages. For instance, diabetes. You don't cure diabetes, you manage it. You manage it with insulin. There are many, many diseases like that that modern medicine cannot cure. Hopefully it can slow it down and simply manage it. Well, regenerative medicine has a different perspective. That diseases, even those, that are end diseases and you can't stop them and they just terminate with death, that those diseases should be able to be stopped and reversed. And regenerative medicine and stem cells play an important role in that. Number two, optimal health. That thing, which modern medicine doesn't deal with, our health, defining it, augmenting it, promoting it, accelerating it, well, regenerative medicine does exactly that. Instead of just managing tissue that isn't working well, you know, for instance, you know, your pancreas if you have diabetes. How about replacing the damaged tissue or the dysfunctional tissue with new, healthy, young tissue that does function well? And then the disease would simply go away and you would be restored to optimal health. That's what regenerative medicine is about. And last but not least, longevity. If you could keep your organs young, you could live a lot longer. It's really that simple. The kind of motto that we play with here, maybe I should trademark it, is that regenerative medicine adds years to your life and life to your years. We kind of like that and that really is what we do with regenerative medicine. So what is a stem cell? Here we have a slide of stem cells. Two critical characteristics define what a stem cell is. Number one, it is in fact what we call an immortal cell. It hangs around for a long time. And while it's, while it's hanging around, it has two things it can do. Number one, you see on the left side of the slide that it is self-renewing. It can, in fact, duplicate itself precisely. And so that new cell that, came, that was the daughter cell of the stem cell is an exact duplicate of the stem cell itself. And the other side, it can differentiate, which means it can turn in to an organ cell, an adult, differentiated organ cell, also known as a somatic cell. So if we have a stem cell in the liver and you, the liver needs a new cell, that stem cell in there is going to pop out into two. One of them is going to be a duplicate of the original and the other one is going to be that new liver cell that the body or the liver needs. Now, while we're here discussing the two characteristics of stem cells, it's a good place to say how they are different from our normal organ cells. The primary difference is that normal organ cells, or let's take the liver again for an example, they can duplicate, but they're very limited in how many generations of duplications they can do, and that's a subject for another lecture. And the other thing is that this fully mature organ cell does not have the ability to stay alive forever. It has that programmed death that we spoke of earlier. 
So limited ability to duplicate, and it is going to die after it ceases to be able to function at peak efficiency. Now here is the, the history of where stem cells come from in our development and where they end up going. So when we are in fact an embryo, we're pretty much all one big collection of stem cells. You have an egg and a sperm, they are both in fact very powerful stem cells because they are going to become everything you are. They come together and they fertilize and that one big cell becomes two, becomes four, becomes eight. Those are very powerful stem cells that are in fact going to evolve into, mature into, transform into every different type of cell in your body. So through that process you see it ends up at the blastocyst. And this is an important distinction here because the blastocyst cells now differentiate into two different types. The pink ones around the outside and the blue ones on the inside. The pink ones are the cells that will not become the baby in the human being. They become all of the embryonic tissue that you need to support the developing fetus. This, this is the, the, uh, the placenta and the umbilical cord. Whereas the blue cells in the middle, those cells are the ones that are going to evolve into, trans into, all the different cells that are you and all the different organs. Here is a larger picture of it. The cells on the outside that become the cord and the placenta and the blue cells in the, in the inside we call them pluripotent or totipotent, and they have the potential of becoming anything. Any cell in your body come from those cells. Here's the hierarchy of how those cells develop. So you start with that blue cell on the top, right, the totipotent or pluripotent cell, and it's going to differentiate into different cell lines, okay, that become the different organ systems. So on the left, we have those that become all the blood cells, and those are not just the red blood cells, but also all of the immune cells that are floating around your body. And then on the other side, we have the cell lines that become the various organs, the muscles and the nerves and the bones and all the other tissues that make up our body. So the organ cells, again, another name for them, are somatic cells. Here we have a diagram, okay, that is depicting the fact that all the organs in your body have those flashing stars in them and those flashing stars are a small percentage of that organ that are in fact stem cells and the stem cells of that organ are in charge of regenerating that organ and replacing the cells that have no longer, um, no longer functioning at peak efficiency and in fact are programmed to die and be replaced. We now see that there are three sources of stem cells. There are the embryonic stem cells, those blue stem cells that are part of a developing fetus. There are the placental stem cells, which are the placenta and the umbilical cord. And of course, all of our adults' organs have stem cells in them as well. So which ones do we use in medicine? Well, for sure, we do not use the first one, the embryonic stem cell. You may recall a few years back, there was a great deal of political upheaval and controversy about the use of embryonic stem cells. Why? Because when you pluck those cells, out of those blue cells, out of a developing embryo, you are in fact interfering with the development of a human life. And for all of the ethical reasons, this is very controversial and should be. Now, from a medical perspective though, we wouldn't use those cells in therapies anyhow, because those cells are still undifferentiated. Remember, they, aren't, they haven't yet decided which line they're going to be a part of, which organ system they're going to be a part of. And so they have all of those options ahead of them and you don't know which direction they're going to go. So if you took some of those cells out to try to cure a liver or heal a liver and stuck them in someone's liver, you don't know that they're going to become liver cells. They could become something else. Not a good situation. So in clinical medicine, they are not used and never were. Okay, so we can just let them go for now. They are used in research purposes, but not for clinical medicine. Now, the placental cells are used and in fact, most of what I'm going to be talking about today are um, the characteristics and the use of, a, of stem cells. These are called mesenchymal stem cells that are extracted out of or harvested from umbilical cords. Now there's no controversy there at all because after the baby is born and then the next delivery, in fact, is the placenta and the cord. And those are considered medical waste. They're going to be incinerated and, and simply disposed of. 
which is a shame because obviously stem cells are in those tissues and they're very valuable. So with the mother's permission, they can be donated to science or given to a cord bank okay, for preservation in case the mother and the child need those cells in the future, or they can be used for medications or for treatments such as we're going to be talking about today. So that's the second source of cells, of stem cells. And then the adult stem cells. Remember, we have them in our own organs. Now, you wouldn't want to extract stem cells from someone's liver. That would be painful and not very efficient. So the three places we can get stem cells out of, out of a human body efficiently, effectively, without causing too much disruption or pain, are bone marrow. You can drill into someone's bone and, re and retract or extract the bone marrow, which is filled with stem cells. Not the most comfortable procedure, I assure you, but it can be done easily. Um, you can simply remove someone's blood and extract stem cells from somebody's blood. Very easy to do. And of course, the fat. There's a lot of stem cells and fat. Those stem cells happen to be dormant, but there's a lot of them in there, and they're commonly used in clinical medicine. About the adult stem cells, what do you do with them after you've harvested them, after you've extracted them from your patient? The patient comes into the office, they want, for instance, a stem cell injection in their knee because they have a banged up knee. You take some of their fat, and the first thing you have to do is clean that fat. So you harvest them, then you clean the fat and extract and distill out the stem cells, okay? And then you prepare them in whatever way is necessary to be re-injected, re-infused into the patient. The concerns about that are as follows. Obviously, the discomfort of the procedure of getting them out. If you're extracting the cells from someone's belly, you're gonna bruise them, okay? And it's not the most comfortable procedure, though with anesthetic, you know, it can be, it, it can be, um, it can be comfortable. Right, but someone's going to bruise and there's going to be some discomfort afterwards in the healing. There's always the possibility of causing an infection from the area from which you've extracted them. There's also the issue of contamination. During the time in the procedure where you are distilling them and cleansing them, repairing them, what if some contaminant got in there? And the last and one of the most important in my mind is the fact that these are stem cells of an adult. This is, let's say, a 50-year-old patient. Well, they have 50-year-old stem cells in there, okay? And they are not nearly as potent, not nearly with as much potential and vitality as the young stem cells that we extract from umbilical cord. Now, there's a lot of science behind this, but let me, let me just say briefly that as we age, two things happen to our stem cells. Number one, we lose the numbers of them. In fact, from a brand new baby to 18 years old, you lose about 60% of your stem cells. And from 18 years old to 30 year old, you lose another 25% of them. So by the time you're 50, 60, and 70, you're down to like 5% of the amount of stem cells you had when you were a baby. Not only that, but the stem cells that you have are not nearly as potent and as functional and as eager, let's put it that way, to do the job that they're supposed to do. So they lose functionality, in addition to the fact that we're losing great amount of numbers. So the stem cells that you extract out of a patient who has that knee issue is not gonna be as vital as umbilical cord stem cells. So here's, an, here's the science behind it. To, be, to give you a very clear example, if we take one of those you know, um, of stem cells out of someone's fat and we put it in a Petri dish and nourish it with all the things it likes to eat and be happy, in 30 days, that one cell is gonna become 200 cells. Not bad, 200 out of one. But that same umbilical cord mesenchymal stem cell, put in the same Petri dish with the same nutrients, in one month's time will become over a billion cells. 200 to a billion. That's the difference between the vitality of an older person's cell not that 50 is old, it's just older, versus a young nascent cell from an umbilical cord whose entire life and vitality is still ahead of it. And the good way to imagine this, since we talk about billions all the time and we kind of don't really know how much a billion is, is if you took 200 quarters, like the 200 cells from an adult, and stacked them up, they'd be 14 inches tall. If you took a billion quarters and stacked them up, you'd be over a thousand miles tall. Thousand miles versus 14 inches. So this is a huge difference in their vitality and their potential. 
and their capacity to regenerate and bring new life to a patient. Okay, so the umbilical cord mesenchymal stem cell. How does it work? What are its characteristics? How does it function? Number one, when you infuse them into someone's body, those cells will home to damaged tissue. And we know this because you can, you can in a special way, put markers on those cells. And if someone has a damaged heart and you infuse those cells into their body, you can see them migrating directly to the damaged tissue. It's brilliant. It's mysterious how they do this, but it's part of the mystery and the, the magic and the miracle of our physiology. Now, when they get to their destination, these stem cells, what they do is they latch on to the microvasculature, the tiny little capillaries of that organ. And when they are attached there, there's one thing they don't do, and there's something that they do do. What they don't do is become that organ tissue. Now, along the way, earlier, I've said how stem cells will duplicate or replicate themselves, and then the other cell will become the tissue that needed to be replaced. These mesenchymal stem cells from the umbilical cord don't do that. It's called engrafting. They do latch on to the little tiny capillaries in that organ, but they don't become that organ tissue. Okay, so what do they do? They, in fact, release this magic soup of these signaling messaging molecules. Remember those little vesicles that were on the surface of the cell? Well, those little bubbles, they, they pop, and this soup comes out, and it's filled with these incredible cytokines which cause massive regeneration of the tissue. And in fact, one of the things that that soup does is stimulate the native stem cells in that organ to do what they used to do when you were a baby. So all this magic happens because of what the cells release. Now, Dr. Kaplan, who was a brilliant scientist who discovered these mesenchymal stem cells and umbilical cords just a few years ago, he named them, of course, and defined them as mesenchymal stem cells, MSC, but this soup that they release, this magic soup, is such a powerful element of why these cells are so powerful in our physiology that he is playing around with the idea of changing MSC from mesenchymal stem cells to medicinal signaling cells, also MSC. So that's how they work. So these mesenchymal stem cells with their magic soup and those little vesicles that release the soup into the body and into the organ that's damaged, etc. What are these, what is the, the, the outcome of this soup of cytokines that is released? Number one, a reduction of inflammation, a massive reduction of inflammation. Now, this is really important because most of our chronic diseases that we all know of, we all heard about them, have as a part of their fundamental element a systemic inflammation of our body. It may only be your joints that are hurting because you have rheumatoid arthritis, but you have, in fact, a massive systemic inflammation throughout your body because of this rheumatoid arthritis. And the, 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 the magic soup that the stem cells release immediately reduces inflammation at its source throughout your entire body. So let me give you an example again using rheumatoid arthritis. The drugs that you hear advertised all the time on TV, Embryl and Humira, they in fact target the markers that you'll find in someone's body, in their blood, that are inflammatory markers showing how much inflammation is going on in their body. And in people with rheumatoid arthritis or other inflammatory diseases, those markers are really high where they shouldn't be. So you take the Embryl and Humira, and after a certain amount of time, usually numerous weeks, Slowly but surely, they will suppress those markers. But those drugs have very serious and many serious side effects that are not good for us. On the other hand, if you give that patient an infusion of stem cells, within hours, a day or two at most, those same inflammatory markers get reduced by like 50%. And there's absolutely no downtime, no side effects, no, no detrimental elements like there are for those pharmaceuticals. And if you give them a second dose, their markers will go down another 50%. So this is powerful medicine. And these are the stem cells are the ones that bring it, that release that medicine into our bodies. Number two on the list are autoimmune diseases. Diseases where our immune system has gone haywire and causing all sorts of havoc in our body. 
Now, many of these diseases we're very familiar with. Things such as rheumatoid arthritis, multiple sclerosis, lupus, IBD or inflammatory bowel disease, even type 1 diabetes, you may not know, is also an autoimmune disease. Psoriasis, which is a skin disease. Even asthma has autoimmune elements to it. And various thyroid dysfunctions are also autoimmune. Now there's a whole other class of, uh, of diseases that have immune dysfunction associated with them that are not exactly autoimmune, but still stem cells work for them as well. And these include diseases where you have a chronic persistent infection that then causes the immune system to get overreactive because it can never calm down because the, the body is infected and the infection doesn't go away. Things like Lyme's disease is a perfect example of that. Uh, or herpes, viruses such as herpes or HIV. These fall into that category as well. Now to understand how stem cells help in diseases such as these, we first have to review briefly how the immune system is supposed to work. So what happens? We have these immune cells, these lymphocyte, white blood cells are often called, and they are designed to react to invaders coming into our body. So take a look at this slide. We have a cell, it is waiting around to be activated. It is properly activated when a virus or bacteria or some kind of invader comes into our body, which causes the cell to become activated, as you can see. Now once it's activated, it's going to expand. In other words, it's going to duplicate itself and create a small army of other cells that are activated to fight that one pathogen, that one invader that started this whole cascade going. Now this is a very, very specific um, function. It is highly controlled because you don't want to get this thing um, going out of control and it's going to then fight the invader that has come into the body. And you'll see that these cells that expanded, this little army of cells, are releasing a whole bunch of special biochemical moderators that are going to fight the infection and attack the infection. Some of these biochemicals are in fact inflammatory biochemicals. It is an inflammation that is necessary. Most people think inflammation is always bad. That's not true. Our bodies need to have inflammation in order to do all sorts of important functions, including the immune system fighting pathogens. So quickly, in sum, when this is a controlled, very specific system, it will deal with invaders without going out of control and hurting things or attacking things that aren't the invaders. In an autoimmune condition or an autoimmune disease, we have our immune white cells, lymphocytes, that are waiting to be activated, but in this case they are activated improperly, abnormally, aberrantly, not by an invading bacterium or virus, but by our own tissue. Something in our tissues has activated the cell. And the cell then goes through this massive clonal expansion. Billions of these cells are created in our body and all of them are releasing these inflammatory biochemicals that are causing the, the disease state in our tissues, are attacking our organs, such as in diabetes. It's attacking our own pancreas and causing us to lose the ability to make insulin. Or they're attacking the cartilage in our joints and creating rheumatoid arthritis and deformation of our joints and all that pain that you see. Now, in traditional Western medicine, we have these pharmaceutical drugs that will work on helping us contain the inflammation that we've been talking about. A great example is rheumatoid arthritis, the drugs Humira and Embro. So how do those pharmaceutical drugs work? They will target those lymphocytes those immune cells and clamp on them and inhibiting their ability to release those inflammatory lymphokine biochemicals. The drugs will also target those inflammatory biochemicals themselves. They will inactivate them. Right? Now again, it takes a number of weeks for this to take place, but there's a problem because it's clamping down not just on these cells, the ones, the aberrant cells that are attacking our tissues, they're clamping down on all the immune cells. So now your immune functions, your natural, necessary, important immune functions are being suppressed throughout your body, which makes you susceptible to other diseases and infections. This is not a good thing. Now let's look at stem cells and see 
how they deal with this autoimmune inflammatory disease situation. They will attack the situation right at the source. Instead of waiting down to the bottom of that slide where all that inflammatory in biochemicals are released by the immune army, by that clonal army, they will go up to the top where that aberrant activation occurs and they will stop the whole system from going out of control where that clonal army is created. They essentially heal the problem at its source. So instead of just managing the disease and trying to manage the inflammation, as pharmaceutical drugs do with all of their many negative side effects, stem cells will essentially cure the disease where it starts. We don't exactly understand how they do this. There's still much about this that is mysterious to us, but the fact is they do it. So again, number one, reduce inflammation. Number two, modulate autoimmune dysfunction. Number three, stimulate regeneration. Well, we've been talking about that all along, and sure enough, if you, if you have a damaged organ or a damaged tissue and you insert these mesenchymal stem cells into that damaged organ or tissue, it starts to regenerate. In fact, it can completely regenerate. Number four, one of the questions that many people have about these stem cells, hey, these stem cells came out of someone else's body. True. So if you take tissue from someone else's body and insert it in my body, aren't I going to have an immune response, a rejection of those things? You've heard, of course, that sometimes people have to, to uh, match. For instance, if someone needs a kidney transport plant, you have to match that kidney, the donor, with the, the kind of cell membranes that you have in your body so that when you insert that kidney, you don't reject it. When you reject a transplanted tissue, the, the reaction of your immune system is intense, and that, in fact, can kill you, let alone not having a functioning kidney. It's called graft versus host disease. Well, as a matter of fact, these mesenchymal stem cells from the umbilical cord don't have the cell you know, components, the cell wall components that cause those kind of reactions. They are what they call immune privileged, so that you can put them in anybody and the, the other person doesn't get a reaction to them. In fact, their ability to modulate immune response is so powerful that not only do you not reject them, but if you're in the middle of rejecting some other you know, tissue that, you, that you've had transplanted, like a kidney, and you're in the middle of, that, of, the, of the terrible chaos of a, of a graft versus host disease, if they infuse those stem cells in you, those stem cells will calm that reaction down and you'll be able to keep the kidney usually okay and you will be cured of that graft versus host reaction and last but not least many people are concerned well will those stem cells grow a tumor in me well no they won't and this is one of the things that the fda required a great deal of research on to be sure that these stem cells don't promote cancer and in fact it's been proven that not only do they not grow cancer they actually will kill tumors cancerous tumors so where do we use them here are the three areas, the inflammation, the autoimmune, and the regeneration. Under inflammation, heart disease, by the way, heart disease is always associated with vascular inflammation. Again, that's a whole topic for another lecture. Liver disease, diabetes, autism, the inflammation of your vasculature also causes strokes. So there's an element of, of inflammation and in, in getting strokes. In the case of autism, again, that's a talk or, or a, a, a subject for another presentation. Just know though that autism is associated with massive GI or intestinal inflammation. And if you give the stem cells to a child who's suffering from autism, even a young adult who's suffering from autism, the inflammation and the GI goes away and the symptoms and the, the characteristics of autism start healing. And it can be very dramatic. Uh, the autoimmune column we've spoken about, rheumatoid arthritis, MS, Parkinson's, Duchenne muscular dystrophy, not necessarily associated with autoimmune. It's more of a genetic disorder. Well, guess what? Stem cells not only arrest the progression of the muscular dystrophy, it can even heal it. It's just incredible, the magic that happens with stem cell therapy. Regeneration, joints, spinal cords, brain strokes, the list is endless. But let me simply say that one of the most dramatic examples is when someone is paralyzed because they've had a spinal cord severed. 
And the prime example is a commercial pilot who was in an accident, has severed his spinal cord, became quadriplegic, obviously lost his license to fly. The stem cell treatment was done on his, on his spine. And a few months later, full function regained, got his license back, and is flying airplanes again. So this kind of thing just, you know, was the stuff of fantasy. And now it's real, it's actually happening. Here is a stem cell coming out of the fog, the magic fog of cryogenic storage, where they have to be stored. This is the fibrin matrix that we extract out of someone's blood and make a spongy stuff out of it. And th this matrix becomes a perfect environment for the stem cells. Remember how we said the stem cells like to hold on to things? They need to hold on to things in order to release their magic soup. Well, we provide that in a fibrin matrix that we derive right out of the patient's blood. And then we insert the, the, uh, the um, stem cells in that environment and mix them together and then infuse that into the joint, you know, that needs repair. So here we, we are extracting the stem cells and here we are mixing them with the fibrin matrix. And here we're preparing the joint. This is an injection into a knee where the knee is injected with, with vitamins and other things that the knee is going to like and the stem cells are going to like, and some procaine, which not only breaks the pain cycle for someone who's in a lot of pain, but also makes the procedure completely comfortable. You don't even feel a thing, barely. And then, of course, there's the injection of the stem cells themselves. And, uh, oh, there's the patient. This is, uh, you may recognize him, that's the famous Dr. John Gray, the author of Men Are From Mars and Women Are From Venus, um, a whole series of incredible books on psychology and relationships. He's a gem of a human being. He's a, you know, an extraordinarily dedicated to naturopathic and regenerative and integrative medicine. And uh, of course, you all know Dr. Pien, who's administering the treatment. This is a picture of a knee just like mine, but not nearly as damaged as mine. You can see above actually is the pre and then below are the, are the photographs of the MRIs of post-treatment. On the left you can see how the articular cartilage is very damaged and very thin and worn down. And beneath it, six months later, you can see how thick and, and cushy and alive and fabulous the articular cartilage is. In my case, the cartilage was completely gone. I was bone on bone and I regenerated it just as you see here not just the articular cartilage, but also the meniscus, and you can see that on the right side of the slide. Again, it's not just the joints, it can be the spine. Anywhere there's bone degeneration, the stem cells can go in there and bring much healing to discs and to the, to the not to the spinal, the spinal cord we know, but obviously she didn't have a spinal cord issue here. It was just the discs and the vertebra themselves. Um, you know, she had a lot of issues uh, of degeneration up in her cervical, neck, cervical spine, and that would generate pins and needles in the hands and loss of ability to grab strongly, and all that can heal up very quickly with stem cells in the, injected around the spine. This is uh, another patient who, within whom we did a, an infusion directly into her blood. Now the way we do that first is we, ex we withdraw some blood from the patient, we ozonate that blood, we infuse that blood with ozone, which is a very powerful regenerative stimulant for the whole body and also reduces inflammation in its own right. As we drip every drop back in, we infuse the stem cells into that flow. And the stem cells love that ozonated blood and so it potentiates the whole treatment. This was on a TV show. They were featuring us, the doctor show. And this patient, you may recognize her. She's an actress and a model in her own right. She's the daughter of Clint Eastwood. Okay, so whatever joint you have an issue with, we can treat it right here and there are many other clinics around that do similar work and wherever you are in the country, uh, somewhere in the state that you're in is bound to be someone who knows how to do this. Stem cell health. This is a subject for another lecture. How do you keep your stem cells healthy? Obviously, they are the engine of regeneration, so the more you can keep them healthier, the, the healthy the, and strong, the stronger and healthy you will be. So basically in a nutshell, you now know all about this God cell, the human stem cell, what it does, where it comes from, and, and, and how important it is for, for your longevity and health and vitality. Bottom line is, they are magic. Bottom line is our physiology is magical and mysterious. And the bottom line is these stem cells can 
as we say, add years to your life and life to your years. Thank you.